Okay, let's get started. All right, your um, sixth assignment, PS6 is out and due Thursday. Uh, and then next week's fall break, so no class now. The week after fall break, there'll be uh, no assignment due because there's midterm on Wednesday after fall break. And then your seventh assignment will be due the week after that, me, on Thursday. So we'll be back in the rotation. I'll probably, I'll try to put that. So the Monday after fall break, we'll do a review for the midterm in class. We'll also do some new materials, depends how long the review takes. And so uh, I'll, I'll try to get the assignment out as soon as I can after, after the Monday class. So have a little extra time to work on it if you need. Are there any questions or problems about anything? Um, first thing I want to do today is talk for a little bit about PS5. So we've got PS5 up here. And once again, I forgot. Get a little bigger. And in particular, the one that seemed to cause the most problem the students was this method right here, get chars that follow pattern. Look at this one here. So I've got two implementations in here. This is the implementation that seemed to be the most common uh, among students. And the other is, is uh, 10 times faster. So we'll, uh, we'll look at both of them and see, why, see if we can figure out why the other one is 10 times faster. So let me just <coughs> guide you through this one and uh, hopefully it looks familiar. We are creating a, what I call a follow list, a list of characters, and that's what we're going to return in the end. So it starts out empty and gradually we add characters to it until we found all the characters that follow the pattern. And then what I do is I have a for loop here that starts out i. i is going to be an index into the text string. So remember what this does. You've got a big long text string, you've got a small pattern, and you're trying to find all the characters that follow the pattern in the string. So for every place it occurs, you want to find the character that follows the pattern. So we'll start, we'll look at i equals 0, then we'll look at i equals 1, i equals 2. Uh, we, won't go, we won't let i get all the way to the end. Why do we stop before we get to the end of text? Yeah? Um, because uh, the text length, say for example, it's uh, 8 characters, index will only be 0 to 7. Well, okay, that is true. He said if there's 8 characters, then... You only go from 0 to 7. But notice it's not even that because I'm subtracting the pattern length off. So what's up with that? Yeah. Because if you add like, the index plus the length of the pattern, you don't want it to exceed the total length of the text. Okay. So basically what she said was when you get yay close to the end of the string, and that's the length of the pattern, you don't keep looking because there's no room for the pattern to be. You know, if the, if the pattern is five characters long, you don't want to be looking to try to find it three characters from the end of the string. So you just go until there's no room for the pattern. In fact, you can cut one off because even if there could fit the pattern, there's no following, so you can cut one off. Right, you go, yeah, and you, you need to, what Stefan just said was you need to cut it off. You don't want to look for a pattern at the very end either because there's no character that follows it. So anyway, what I do for each of these indexes that I'm generating, I take the substring. So I say start index i, and then uh, go from there the pattern length and I get the substring out of the text, and I see if it's equal to the pattern. So I just move down the string, saying, okay, get this chunk out, is that equal to the pattern? Get this chunk out, is that equal to the pattern? And if I do find one that's equal to the pattern, I grab the, uh, I go into the text, I grab the, the character that follows the pattern, and add to my follow list. So that's, uh, just for my limited looking around at people's solutions, that seemed to be a pretty popular one. So, do you have any questions about this? Yeah? Why only increment by one every time? Why only increment by one every time? Well, let's say that the... <coughs> suppose this is your text. It's a bunch of A's. Mm -hmm. And suppose your pattern is... A. So you 
look here, you find it. You don't want to, you look here, you find it. You don't want to look here, find it, and skip to here. Yeah. So can you, can you increment by the length <coughs> of the pattern? Okay, okay, now you ask, can't you increment by the length of the pattern? Well, you tell me, suppose the pattern is AA. All right, we find this one first. But what's the next character we ought to get? So this, this matches the pattern. Why do we not want to shift over by two? The next one. Because the next occurrence of the pattern is right there. It overlaps with the original pattern. So you, you always want to push forward by one if you're taking this approach. Okay. Thanks for asking that. Any other questions I can answer? Okay. Well, let's, I call this, I'm going to change the name back to get chars that follow the pattern alt. And I'm going to just call this one X here. So I'm going to run, you know, the main method up here uh, reads Pride and Prejudice, generates a thousand characters using a level five. So let's just run it. Well, I just messed up. I'm going to kill it here. I'm going to start counting when I do this. So I'm going to run it, and we're just going to count. So 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, 1,006, 1,007, 1,008, 1,009, 1,010, and it ought to show up about now. But Let's take it taking a nice long time. In my office, it took about 10 seconds. Okay. For some reason, it took longer here, but possibly because when I was in my office, I wasn't live streaming the lecture on the laptop. So it took about 10 or 11 seconds in my office to generate the characters. And I, I know I heard from people on the discussion forum wondering why uh, their program took 10 seconds. Was that normal? And uh, I, if you use that method, I think it is normal. Now let's look at... Name this all this stuff back. Let's look at another way of doing it. That's the way I did it. Okay. So once again, I create follow list and return it when I'm done. And first thing I do is I find the index. I, I call the index of method on the string and say find the first occurrence of the pattern in the text string. So it's going to, you know, it's going to look through, search for the pattern, and when it finds it, it'll tell me the index of the pattern. So when I have that index, then I can compute uh, the index of the character that follows the pattern. It's just the index plus the pattern length. If that index would take me, if the index is still part of the string, I go and grab it and add it to the follow list. And then here's the key part. I compute a new index that way. Now. Why don't I just say index equals text.index of pattern? In other words, why don't I do this? That's what I did before the loop. Why don't I just do that again? Yeah? Because you didn't change the text it was looking at. Okay, we, we're, we're, if I did that, I would get exactly the same index back. The string didn't change. The pattern didn't change. So if it was, if the, if I'm still asking for the first occurrence. So there's two versions of index of. That one there we get to tell it where to start looking. So it says, tell me the, the, the next index of the pattern in text, starting at index plus one and moving to the right. So I ask for the next occurrence of the pattern. And I just keep doing that until it, it returns negative one, which means there is no occur it found no occurrence of the pattern. Okay. Now that, Let's we'll see how this works out. Uh, let me run it. And it took about, uh, okay, so it took about two seconds here. So I think it's about 10 times faster. I think the other one maybe could have taken 20 seconds. So either way is fine. I didn't have any efficiency constraints on your solution. But it's worth considering why is this so much faster than the first way? Does anyone have an idea? Yeah. Because it's not searching the whole text every time. He says it's because it's not searching the whole text every time. But is that, even, is that really true? No. My code is not searching through the text. But index of is. 
Okay? Index ob is doing the searching. So, what's going on? Yeah? Well, rather than checking if it's true at every single spot along it, mm -hmm. well, I guess it is technically doing that, but never mind. I'm <laughs> okay. So far, all we, all we, what we're agreeing on is that in the first version, my code is going along looking for an occurrence of the pattern. In this new version, the index of methods code is moving along looking for the pattern. So what's up? Yeah. So the index of method is a lot more simple than your code, and so it doesn't have to run check like three or four different statements before. Okay. So he's. He's postulating that the, ind the index of method is simpler than my code. In fact, I don't believe that's true. But you're getting at the truth. Yeah? Using the index code, uh, or index of, uh, it starts where you left off, so you don't uh, search through this big long string over your search. Okay, he's saying it starts, it, you know, it starts where it left off before index of does, but so did my code. My code never backed up to the start and looked some more. It, it just looked at all the characters. Yeah. I think the uh, index of method is just a lot more efficient in searching than Okay. Else. What he just said is the truth. It doesn't really explain why. He said the, the, the Java's index of method is a lot more efficient than my method, than that alternate method of searching for a match. In fact, this problem of finding occurrences of a pattern in a string has been studied to death by computer scientists. And there are lots of uh, famous algorithms, not lots of algorithms, there are a number of algorithms, a couple of which are very famous, that have been found for doing this particularly efficiently. It doesn't mean if you looked at the code that it would be simpler code. It's just more clever code. If you looked at the code, it would be hard to understand. Okay? It's the kind of thing you study in algorithm class. You try to understand where the efficiency comes from. So I can't really explain to you right now why it's more efficient. I can give you an inkling, though. Uh, the important thing to understand is that often, if you can find a way to implement something by using built-in methods instead of doing it yourself, you're going to find a more efficient solution. So let's think about this. This is uh, <coughs> let's say you've got a string here. A a a a a. Let's just say you've got a bunch of A's, and then in the middle are five X's, and, and then a bunch of A's. And the pattern you're looking for is X, 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 X. Now, my, my code that finds the match, what is it doing? Yeah? Okay, so it pulls out a chunk of five characters, makes a string from it, that's expensive, compares it to that string and finds out it's different. Then it shifts over, takes out the next five A's, makes a, sub, makes a string of it, compares it. Let me tell you a better way to do it. Suppose you write a loop that starts with the last character of the pattern. And then this is, this is where we are right now, and compares it to the last character of this five character chunk. When we find out they're different, what can we do? Is there any reason to look at the rest of these characters for a match? No. And in certain circumstances, I don't think in this, this case it will work. Yeah. Is there any point in shifting over by one at this point? You know that that character is not an X. You know that all these characters in the pattern are X. There's no point in shifting by one and looking for a match. It's going to fail. You can shift all the way over and look at the next five characters. And so this thing isn't even looking at all the characters in the text string. Yeah. So what makes you shift by the um, length of the pattern? So how can you do that? Well, this is a special case. But if you know that the, the, the pattern contains all X's, and you know that this character right here is not an X, then if I shift over by one, that character is still not going to match anything in the pattern. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, so how can you um, shift by... So so now we are shifted by the length of this uh, pattern, right? If we find the, the final character is not X. Mm -hmm. So how can I do that? Shift by five this time. Well, oh, you just you just add five to your index and start looking there. So uh, okay, okay. 
I don't want to spend time debugging the algorithm because it, it, I didn't describe a full algorithm. I just tried to give you some insight into how this works. If you're really interested in this, uh, come talk to me after class and, and we get to the bottom. The, the, the main point I'm trying to get over to the class here is there's, there's a lot of depth to computer science that may not be apparent at first. When you're just learning to program, you think, oh, it's all about mastering semicolons and, and, and braces. But uh, there are lots of people that work very hard to find efficient ways to do common things. And this is one of them. Yeah? Uh, so another reason that your um, the second method can be faster is because the if statement is comparing to integers rather than two strings? That's true. So what she just observed is that this method here, after it finds, if it, after it finds a match, well, it's, it's Nowhere in here are we comparing strings. We're only comparing characters, which are integers. And in fact, the index op method is not comparing strings either. It's comparing integers. So that's another, another source of efficiency. Uh, typically, you're not better off writing it yourself. You're better off using stuff in the Java library. Not only are they guaranteed to be correct, they're going to be faster than anything you're going to come up with, most likely. So anytime you can leverage the library, you should do so. All right, so I, I didn't get a chance to do it for class. I'll post, uh, I'll post the solutions in the, in, uh, on the web page. And the solutions also contain the test cases I used. I used 24 test cases for the four methods to grade, six, six for each method. So you can see what the test cases were. Even run them against your code and see how you did. Um, one thing I want to mention, uh, part of the assignment was to add some test cases. And for this one, we're very lenient. We just expected one more test case per method. And a lot of people didn't do that. They either didn't realize they're supposed to be writing test methods, or they just decided to skip that part. For the current assignment, I have told the TAs that if you are called, if they are called over and, and let's say you call them over and ask a question about your method you're working on, they're going to ask to see the test cases you wrote for it. If you didn't write test cases, they're not going to help you on the method. They'll help you with the test cases if you have a question. Because what I've found is we keep helping students with their methods and they don't understand what the method's supposed to do. It's really tough to implement a method if you don't understand what it's supposed to do. And writing test cases is a good way to understand what a method's supposed to do. Yeah? Um, is there, this is kind of just like a little side note, is there a certain place that we'll be able to look to see the whole Java library to see like what, like what options there are for like text off link? Is there a certain place that we can go to? I don't know if this is already going to happen. Yeah, so he's asking, how do you find out what methods there are? I mean, one way is just to go to a string. No, I'm not there. Like, you know, we could do text dot, and it shows you all the methods. The other way is there's a link from the class webpage to the Java API documentation. You can click there and you can see the whole thing. If you're really curious, you can go find, you can download the source code for the Java library. If you really want to know what, how IndexOp works, uh, you can download the Java library and look at it if you want to. It's a good way to learn. Yeah? For PS6, is there a requirement of test cases that we need to write Well, the, the, the idea is you need to thoroughly test each method. Now, I, in more advanced classes, I got ways of quantifying that. But as a rule of thumb, you need to at least have one test case for each reason the thing might throw an exception. Right? So if it says, in this case, throw an exception, in that case, throw an exception, in that case, throw an exception, there's three test cases you've got to have right there. Yeah? If each of those cases are throwing the same exception, do you combine that into one test method? She asked, can you combine it into one test method? For testing exceptions, no, because you, you need to write a separate test case for each reason it might throw an exception, because only way to write a test case, the way I told you to write test cases for exceptions, all it will test is whether an exception was thrown, not, not where it was thrown. And then for the non-exceptional test cases, you know, you need, ideally you would test what are called the corner cases. Like what happens, test, what, test the behaviors right if the input is, if the string is empty, let's say, if that's an input. Or when the index is zero sort of test around the edges where things tend to, to fail, and then you have a couple test cases for the general case. I'm, I'm 
I, you know, we're not that strict. I'm just trying to get you to think about testing seriously as something. I, you, you create test cases before you write the code because it'll help you understand what the method's supposed to do, and then you'll have test cases. You'll have test cases to run your code against. Yeah? Okay, so let's say it's like crunch time, the assignment's almost due. Mm -hmm. All the test cases work except for one. I'm making like one silly mistake. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong if I just catch that exception? And just like, so like, just, I don't know, like, is there a message or like retry something else or? Okay, so I say he's, it's up, he's up against the clock and he's got one exception that shouldn't be happening. You can catch it, but that's not going to make you pass my test cases because yeah. the ones we use for grading. So. But if you only got one mistake, that's not so bad. That's probably a point. So. Yep? Do you have any uh, J unit stuff on the test? Well, he asks, is it going to be J-unit stuff on the test? I, I'm not going to have you write any test, testing code on the test. I'm expecting to know what J-unit is. Okay. Question. Yes? Do you have any sort of study guide for the test? Uh, a study guide for the test. Well, I'll, I have a set of slides that I'll post that sort of summarize what we've studied. Uh, the best way to prepare for the test is to look at those slides and to look at Make sure you understand how to do all the assignments and that you understand the examples from lecture. Okay, so enough about that. In the lab. And from, yeah, code from the lab. Just any code that you've seen. No, I mean, the lab we're going to re be reviewing. Yeah, there'll be a review done in the lab before the intern. All right, now we're going to talk about some new, some new Java stuff. <coughs> So it turns out classes can have variables. <coughs> this won't be on the test. Right. Yeah, we're not, yeah, this stuff isn't on the test. This is it doesn't mean it's, it's not on the midterm. It's on the final. And there'll be an assignment involving it. In fact, what you're gonna learn today, what, what we're gonna learn today is how to write classes. And what I mean by that is how to create new types of data. So we're, uh, up to this point, it's all been static methods. Now it's going to be constructors, instance variables, uh, non-static methods. Right? Very different. Um, when I learned a program, none of this was a consideration. This is all stuff that's been developed in the last 30 years or so, 30, 40 years. So up here, I'm not going to read these comments to you. They're for you to look at later. I'll, I'll tell you what I want you to know. Um, you have used static variables. So in there, right there, there are two. So when you declare, you can declare a variable inside a class, just like you can declare a method. And you can declare that variable to be static, just like you declare a method to be static. That code I just highlighted contains two static variables declared in, in system classes. Can you pick them out? This is from the Java library. Yeah. Okay, so pi right here, in the math class, there is a variable called pi. Okay? And we can refer to it as math.pi just like we would, we could get to a method defining, if there, you know, a method in the math class. How do you know pi is not a method? How can you tell just from looking at it right there that pi is not a method? Yeah. There are no parentheses after it. So if you have a, uh, a static variable declared in the class, you can refer to it just by giving class name dot variable name, as long as it's public. What's the other static variable up there? Yeah? Um, I was, I was going to say that it maybe prints a new line character after. Not exactly, no. Oh. Print line is a method. Hmm. Yeah? Out. Out. You've done that a lot. You may, not have made, you may have wondered what you were doing when you did said system.out. There is a static variable declared in the system class called out. And its value is a print stream that prints to the console. So you've been using static variables from the very first program that you wrote. 
Out is a static variable. Now, what out and pi have in common is they cannot be changed. If you try to say system.out gets something, you try to change system.out, it'll say the final field system.out cannot be reassigned. Same thing with math.pi. We won't let you change them. They're variables in name only. They're actually constants because you can't change them. Now, before I show you why you can't change them, why is it a good thing that you can't change them? Who could make the argument that it would be a bad idea to be able to change pi? Yeah? Every job program is going to use those. So if you change it, then you're going to have different values for different programs. Right. I mean, I'll summarize what he said. People depend on math.pi being 3.14159 and on and on. If you change it to 3, your program's not going to make any sense. System.out, people depend on system.out being the way you print to the console. If that can change, then it gets confusing. Yeah? Uh, how does show message dialog differ from system.out? Okay, well, system.out is a variable that contains a print stream. Show, method, show message dialog is a method. A void method that has a side effect of displaying a message. Okay, so we've done lots with static methods, not so much with static variables. So these guys here are, uh, are called static final variables. Final means constant. So here's a couple declarations of this, in this class here, this class is called static variables, that's just what I named it. Here I declare two static variables, one called my school and one called minimum voting age. And I declare them to be public, which means they can be accessed from outside the class. They're final, meaning they can't be changed. You can't reassign their values. They're static, because that's all we're looking at at the moment, are static variables. And then the rest, you know, it has a, uh, has a type, a name, and a value. So these are not declared inside any method. They're declared, declared outside methods, just the top level of the class. Yeah? Um, so when you declare the variable and you say static in it, we mm -hmm. haven't done that yet so far. Right. Usually you don't type static. Does it mean that Java assumes static by default? Okay, he said we haven't typed static before we declared variables. But you haven't declared any variables outside of methods before either. Every variable you've declared has either been a parameter or a local variable. There, static isn't an issue. These are variables declared that belong to the class the same way a method does. See? Here is demo one. That's a method, a static method. We scroll down at the same level of indentation are these two static variables, these static variables, that static variable. Okay? So this just says, there's my school is a constant. So anywhere in the program, you can use my school as a string, and it will always be University of Utah, and there's no danger it can change. And the voting age can't change either. Yeah? So since final and static both mean um, the variable is uh, a constant, so why do we have both of them? Okay, he said, the question, the, the assertion behind his question was that final and static both mean the variable can't change. That's not the case. Final means a variable can't change. If I take that out, it's still a static variable. I can still access it throughout the program because it's public. It's still associated with this class, but it's no, no longer final. It's no longer constant. It can be changed. So final is what makes it unchangeable. Static just governs how you access it. You access it by giving the class name followed by the variable name. Yeah? So the final variables variable's name should be all uppercase? The, the convention in Java that's violated by system.out, by the way, is to put constants, class constants like this, in uh, all uppercase with underscores, you know, with the breaks. So that's what I do. That, yeah? Is there a particular reason how it breaks that convention? I, I can only speculate why out breaks that convention. So I, I won't try to speculate. I've never, I've never really investigated it. Okay. Now, you can also have private static variables. And the place you use these 
you use these in programs to avoid what are called magic numbers. So suppose you're, you've created a graphical user interface. You've got a window, and you want to put an image. And you decide that it looks best if the image is 65 pixels down from the top of the window. So one idea would be in your program, everywhere you need to deal with the, where the image is located, you put the number 65. So you say, put this image at 65 comma 65. Another approach is to define a constant called offset from top, set to 65, and then use offset from top everywhere you mean 65. Why is the first way called a magic number? What's magic about 65 occurring about a dozen times in your program? Yeah? You don't know what supposed to be doing. Yeah, you see a 65. You don't know what, you know, why is that a 65? Is the fact that all 12 of these 65s in the program, are they supposed to all be the same, or is it just coincidence? It's just a number that appears with no explanation in the code. What's the advantage of doing it this way? Yeah? Um, if you need to adjust any kind of like number thing, like if you decide that you want to have it like 63 down, if you just switch that one declaration, all the numbers will switch to Right. So one, one, one advantage he just said was, it makes it easier to change it. You can use it a bunch of places. You can change it once. Change it from 65 to 63, and that change applies everywhere. What's another advantage? Yeah? It's easily readable to you know, another programmer what it's supposed to do. Right. Offset from top is a lot more meaningful than 65. Plus, you can put a Java doc comment on this constant. And then just hover the mouse and find out what it's there for. Lots of advantages. So we get in a hurry when we program and we try to put we end up putting these magic numbers in code, but when you, uh, ideally what you do, especially when you're cleaning your code up, is get rid of those magic numbers and make them symbolic constants. If you look at this week's assignment, there's one place in the code where I've done that. I've given you some, some of these constants to play with. Yeah? Um, how do you write java.comments for variables? Same way, that there is a java.comment for offset from top. Oh, okay. It's not a very good comment, but yeah, you just do that, yeah? Point out that there's two stars. A lot of people are just putting comments. Yeah, Java doc is slash star star. You know, if you've got any uh, question about whether you've defined Java doc, just make sure it works. You know, I should be able to go anywhere I use offset from top, which unfortunately, I'll do it right here. I'll put offset from top right here. Hover the mouse over it. You know, yeah, offset from top. Int d equals offset from top. I first got to get it syntactically correct. Then I can hover the mouse. And I see the Java doc. All right. If you're not doing, if you're just doing slash star, you're not writing Java doc. Slash star star. Okay. Now, why make these public and these private? Yeah. You don't want someone to be able to call the call this uh, variable from outside and change it. Well, that's the whole judgment. Is does it make sense to access this variable outside the class or not? So it's just a design decision. So you know, I guess it might make sense to to have my school define and then be able to reference it throughout the application. So there'd be a consistent school in an entire application or a consistent voting age. On the other hand. The number of pixels that some image is supposed to be offset from the top of a window, while important in this class, because that's where it's being used, is going to be of absolutely no interest to the larger world. They don't care what the offset is, so you make it private. It, but, you know, there's no hard and fast rule, just what makes sense. Is it, does anyone care about this thing outside the class? If the answer is no, just make it private to simplify the interface. Now. Every example of a static variable up to this point, it's been fine. You can also do something like this. You can declare a static variable that is not final. But let me tell you, it is almost always, at least 99% of the time, a bad idea. A not, you know, if you declare a static variable like this, that I will be visible in the entire program. It will be available as static variables dot I. 
And I have students, they'll do something, this is their thinking. They'll say, you know, I keep, I'm tired of declaring I every time I use it. 4NI equals 0. I'm going to declare it once as a static variable, and then I don't have to worry about it anywhere else in the class. It's pre-declared. That is a phenomenally bad idea. Who could articulate why uh, replacing 10 declarations, you declare I once in each method, replacing it with a single declaration is bad. Yeah? You might have more students different things. If you have one master variable, one all of them, it may not do what you want to do. Okay. We said, if you have one declaration of a loop variable, it may not do what you want to do. Think about it this way. Suppose you have a loop for i equals 0, whatever, and that in that loop, you call a method. And say that method you're calling also has a loop that iterates over i. If they're both using the same declaration, the static i up here, they're going to mess each other up. I've had students that declare a variable static so they won't have to have so many parameters to a method. They sort of pass the parameters by assigning to static variables. These are often called global variables. It's just, it's, you, you, you have to get good at programming before I could explain uh, a, a case where it makes sense to use a non-final a non static variable. So for right now, for this class, just don't even consider it. If you're declaring a static variable, it's got to be final. Okay, so just put that out of your head. All right, so I've spent this time talking about static variables because we're going to spend the rest of today talking about non-static things, and I want to be able to contrast them. Let's take, take a few-minute break, and then we're going to look at something completely different. Begin again. All right, so I'm still in this project, so I'm going to move away from static variables. I'm going to show you something new here. So this is a class. It's called Coord1. So the idea is we're going to develop a class that lets you represent positions on Earth, latitude and longitude. So as far as I know, there's no such <coughs> class, no such type of object in the Java library that lets you uh, have a single object which represents a position on Earth. And this is my first attempt. So I've declared a class called Coord1 with an empty body. Now, what this buys us, just declaring a class like that, we can now declare variables of type Coord1. So anytime you create a new class, you have created a new type name, a new reference type name. So we can declare variables of type chord1. Furthermore, we automatically get a zero argument constructor that, uh, that we can use. It really doesn't do anything interesting, but it, if we don't define a constructor, we get one for free. So let's see what that lets us do. So I have this class here called main.java. And I'll run it once this way. So I create a string, a scanner, and a random number generator, and I call it display zero. And display zero just prints out the string, prints out the scanner, prints out the random number generator, prints out a blank line. So if I run it, console's down here. It printed out the string. It printed out the scanner, which looked kind of weird. That's like a bunch of details about the scanner. And then it printed out the random number generator. It looks like that. So why did it print them? Print hello. Why did it print the string in such a nice fashion, and the scanner in such a weird fashion, and the random in such a useless fashion? Yeah. Okay, he said the default constructors for the scanners and random generator aren't any good. It has nothing to do with the default constructors. It has to do, every class, whether it wants to or not, has a two-string method. If you don't do anything, if you create a class and you don't define a two-string method, you get one for free. And the way, it, the, the, way the default two-string method works 
is it prints out the fully qualified name of the, of the class, in this case, java.util.random. Then it prints out an at sign. And then it prints out, you can interpret that right there as the address in memory of the object that you just printed out. So that's not very useful. But that's the default behavior. Now, if you, if you define a bit, you can define a better version of toString, and the string class does it, and the scanner class does it. But how the heck are you going to print out a scanner? So the folks that define the scanner class just decided when you, when you print out a scanner, it will just print out and tell you what delimiters are being used and other, other stuff. Not very pretty to look at. But anyway, that's all that method is doing. So let's come up to this main method again. Remember we have our core one. So I'm going to delete that or comment, uncomment it. So just by defining a chord one class with nothing else in it, I can declare a variable of type chord one, and I can create new chord one objects. So I can create P1, I can create P2, and I can display them. Now what do you suppose it will print out when I display them? Let's look at the method now, display two. It's just going to print out the first object, the second object, and the blank line. So what do you think it will print out when I run it? Yeah? Location yeah, it'll print out the full class name followed by an at sign followed by location and memory. So let's run it. And let's see what we get. It printed these two things out here. It says coords.coord1, so that's the package name and the class name. And the first one is at 42A57993, that's a hex address. And the other one is somewhere else. So you know they're different objects because they're sitting in different places. Okay, so you, you get that for free, just by declaring the class. And in fact, if we did this, P1, there's actually there's an equals method, a get class method, a hash code method, a two string method, and so on. So there's some methods you automatically get for free. The default behavior may not be what you want, but you can, you can customize it if you wish. So that's chord one. Now let's look at the next version of it. This is chord two. What have I done here? What's different besides the name, which is chord two instead of chord one? What's different between this class and the one that came before it? Yeah? You have two instances or a variable? Right. We have these two variables. Now, we just spent half an hour talking about variables. But those were static variables. Notice these are not static variables. They're non-static. So those are called, I think it says it up here somewhere, they are called instance variables, or member variables, or fields, just depending on what book you're reading. So they have various names. I prefer the name instance variable. And here's the importance of instance variables. First thing I should point out is, I made these public. I'm going to make them private later. Never make instance variables public. So this is not an example to emulate. Instance variables should always be private. No exceptions. Okay? So here's the deal. If you have instance variables in your class, <coughs> like we do, and let's say that we say we create a new core too. What you get in memory when you create a new object using the constructor that you get for free is you get space in memory to store a lat and a long, latitude and longitude. So we have these two instance variables, lat and long. So when I say uh, coord to x equals new coord to. Then x gets a reference to a new object in memory that has a place to store latitude and a place to store longitude. So the way I think about it is, think of, uh, think of the class as being a rubber stamp, and the rubber stamp has the instance variables on it. So when you say new core 2, you stamp out a new <coughs> place in memory to hold the instance variables of an object. If I do it again, I stamp out a place to store Latin long for another object. So I can have no objects of type core 2, or I can have a million. 
But every one of them, when you create a new one, when you have new core two, you have created a place in memory to store Latin long, in this case. In general, you get space to store all the instance variables. Okay? So what do you think happens when you say new scanner? Yeah? So, um, when you create a new scanner, uh, you allocate some memory for the new object. Okay. He said when you say new scanner, what gets allocated in memory is space for the new object. What's in that object? What is stored inside that object? Got an idea? Is it the string that the scanner is being used on? He said, is it the string that the scanner is being used on? Perhaps. Yeah? It's fields and methods. Okay, he says fields and methods. Well, let's think about it. If I create a new scanner, I create space to store what? Yeah? Fields and uh, the number method. Well, over here I'm just storing... Why, why are Latin long showing up in this box? Yeah? Because they're instance variables. They're the instance variables of core 2. So what would show up in this box? Instance variables of scanner. Why don't you know what the instance variables of scanner of the scanner class are? You don't know the instance variables of the scanner class, of the string class, of the random class, of the array list class, of the array set class, of the array map class, or of any class you've used. Why not? Are you just not been paying attention? Yeah. They're private. They don't show up when you hover the mouse. They're not in the Java doc documentation. They're private. They don't matter to you. They are of no consequence to you. How do you use a scanner? When you want to do something with a scanner, what do you do? Yeah? You call a method. Those methods have access to the instance variables. The idea behind creating a new class of object is you decide what instance variables you need but you don't show them to the user. You provide methods that interact with those instance variables on your behalf. Okay? So every time you do a new, some object is being created in memory and it's going to have some instance variables. It just depends on what's declared for that class. That's really no concern of yours, unless you're implementing the class. So we can do this. Now let's go look at, let's see. Here is my method, main.java here. So we're going to change it now so that this code runs. Jump. Lights. Lights. And let's see what we're going to do. Well, that's no good. Oh, core 2. Okay. So we create a new coordinate object. We say p3.lat gets 17, p3.long gets 22. We can do that. Why? Why are we able to say p3.lat? Yeah? Because that counts public. Because it's public. If it were private, we couldn't do that. And we can set p4.lat to 55 and p4.long to 67. Notice, static variables, there's <coughs> one per class. I mean, static variables are associated with the class. Instance variables are associated with instances, objects. Every object has its own copy. So that's one thing that's confusing to students, is they look at this and they say, ah, there's one declaration of lat and one declaration of long, and then, then they sort of think, okay, there's only one variable for the whole class called lat and one variable called long. No, that would be true if they were static. These are instance variables. Each object gets its own variables, its own set of instance variables. So this is more like a template than actual variables. So here's our main method. Display2 down here prints out 0.1.lat, a space, 0.1.long, a space, and then it prints out 0.1, the whole object. So if we run it, 
you see what gets printed out at the end. 17.0, that's 0.1.lat, because we set it to that. Here's uh, 0.1.long, and there's the just the default version of the object, or the two-string method. Yeah? Oh, could you just repeat what you said about the difference between a static and a non-static variable? Yeah, he asked if I could repeat the difference between a static and non-static variable. With a, non, with a static variable, you can refer to it as class name dot variable name. There's just one variable that's associated with a class can be used from anywhere. The instance variable, that's not, it's not static, it's an instance variable, you can't say class, you couldn't say coord 2lat or coord 2long The instance variables are associated with the objects. Each time you create an object, it gets its own lat1 and lat2. Now, to drive this home, let's go back to core 2 here. No, that's not going to work. Let's go back to main.java. And down here is display 2. And I'm going to set a breakpoint right there at the beginning of the method. And I'm going to run it in debugger mode. And here we are. So we're on this line. Let's look at point 1 and point 2. Now, I can't even see without my glasses, hopefully. Some of you can see it. Up there, point one right here. Look where it says value over there. What does it say next to, what, uh, under value? What's it say for that first one? It says core two, and then it says ID equals 16. You can think of 16 as sort of being an, uh, it's Eclipse's version of addressing memory. It's just a way to tell objects apart. So you can tell that coord one, that point one and point two refer to different objects. How do you know that? Because one is object number 16, the other is object number 18. They're different objects. If we crack open point one, what are we going to find inside? Okay? Um, the values of lat and long. You find lat and long. And this, this lat, point one's lat is 17, and uh, Point one's lawn is 22, and if we scroll on down here and expand out point two, you see that uh, point two's lat is 55 and its lawn is 67. Those two objects have their own variables, their own instance variables. Each instance, each object, has a private set of variables. Okay? Now, incidentally, I think it's important to recognize that what we're talking about today is going to, we're going to be following this idea, this is object-oriented programming, this is, this is we're really, what we're doing really becomes object-oriented. We're going to be following it all semester, okay? It's important to get a really good fundamental understanding of what's going on today, or you're just going to be struggling to catch up. So if you're sitting there, not following, You've got to ask the questions. Okay, here's the next take. Let's see what I've changed. Nothing that's visible yet. It's still called, it's called core three. That's one change. I've still got a public instance variable left, and a public instance variable long. Ah, but I have implemented a constructor. So before we were getting a, a constructor for free that did nothing, just so we could get off the ground. Typically, when you implement a class, you provide one or more constructors. The job of a constructor is to take in parameters and to initialize the instance variables. Okay? So let's look at what, core, what the constructor does. S let's skip this stuff right here. Skip the stuff I just highlighted. What's the bottom line? It takes in, a, a, uh, it takes in two parameters, a, a, something called lat coord and something called long coord. So if you were to call it, let's go to main here, and I'll show you how you call it. That, you know, when you call it and you say create me a new core, you've got to pass in two parameters, the initial lat and the initial long. Okay? You can, you're calling the constructor right here in this new, and the constructor takes two parameters. So there we have it, two parameters in the constructor. And if we ignore this stuff, what's happening? Yeah? It takes the uh, values you get in the parameter and turns it into the private variable. 
Right. It just takes what we gave it, and in this case, it's pretty simple. It just stores the latitude and the longitude. We give it to a latitude and longitude, it stores in the instance variable, so it initializes the object. But what else does it do? What's happening with that code up there uh, highlighted? Yeah. 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 Right. It makes sure that the latitude and longitude that we're given makes sense. Latitude, that's you know, degrees from the equator to the North Pole and then down to the South Pole, needs to range between negative 90, which is the South Pole, and positive 90, which is the North Pole. So we're making sure the latitude is in the right range. Longitude ranges from uh, 180 at the international date line, and then it sweeps through Asia, Europe, across North America, South America, uh, somewhere over the UK it becomes, goes from positive to negative, hits zero, the, uh, the, Gren the, what, the Greenwich Meridian, I think that's what it's called, and then it becomes more negative as it goes back to the international date line. So, we make sure the latitude and longitude are in, uh, in the right range, and if not, we throw an exception. Okay? Otherwise, you know, if an exception is thrown, the object is not created. Otherwise, we store these things there. Now, having just said that, let me ask you another question. Why should instance variables be private? Yeah? Does that change the, um, the instance variables for core 2? Well, what change? Say that again. So when you, when you store the uh, Latin lawn chord, mm -hmm. the Latin lawn, mm -hmm. wouldn't that change it for chord 2? He's asking, won't this change it for chord 2? No. no. What Latin lawn are changed when we do this? Yeah? Uh, the chord 3 Latin lawn, but um, if you edit them directly, if they're public, then it doesn't go through the okay. verification. So she's answering my original question. Instance variables are private so that we can prevent the user from directly changing them. Because if the user could directly change them, they wouldn't necessarily go through that validation test. So as it stands, we can't assume, if the instance variables were private and it was impossible to directly assign them, we could assume that any coordinate that has been created is going to have a valid latitude and longitude because the constructor makes sure that's the case. But if the instance variables are public, someone could set the latitude to 1,000 and, and that might break our code elsewhere. So you make them private to force the user to go through your constructors and your methods. Now, I still don't have a satisfactory answer for what lat and long are changed right there. You said what? That object's copied. I mean, he said that object's copied. Okay. That's, you want to have a different take? Yeah. The Latin long have to deal with the class code 3. Say that again. The Latin long that have to do with the class code 3. Okay, he said the Latin long that have to do with the class core 3. That's not right because instance variables are not associated with classes. Instance variables are associated with objects. Why is this constructor being called? What made this constructor, constructor be called? Yeah? Um, in the main method, when we said new code 3, we had to, uh, we had two doubles inside the brackets. Yeah, that's where, that's one place it's being called from. So new creates a new place in memory to store a coord with room for Latin long. The constructor fills out that Latin long. So the constructor is, is accessing instance variables of the object that just got created by that new. Let's look here. How do you know this isn't a method? What's the dead giveaway that this is a constructor and not a method? Yeah? There's no like return type. There's no like string. Or... There's no return type notice. It doesn't say void. It doesn't say int. It just says public and then the name of the constructor. Well, that's one thing. Constructors never have return types. Their job is just to initialize a chunk of memory by filling in the instance variables. And, yeah? Same name class. The constructors always have the same name as their class. So class core 3, the constructor is called core 3. You don't get to decide what to name the constructor. Same as the class. Yeah? Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, can we have multiple constructors? Like he, asked, he asked, can you have multiple constructors? Yes. 
as long as they take different, so you can tell them apart. They got to take different types of parameters, different numbers of parameters. Um, also, for this, if you try to declare um, an object of type code three and we don't give anything inside the brackets, like we just leave it blank, mm -hmm. will that be an error? Or okay, so we ask, what happens if you uh, call core three and you don't provide two parameters? Well, let's go see here. So what if I said this? Uh, core three px equals new core three. That's an error. So if you don't define any constructors at all, Java will give you one that takes no parameters for free. If you define any constructors, it won't do that for you. It doesn't like the fact that I changed the running program, so I'm gonna, I forgot to kill the program. Okay. Now, let's try this. We are, let's see, we're sitting here in chord three. There's a constructor. I'm going to put a breakpoint. So we'll see what the constructor is called. We'll go to main here. And where did I break main? I did that. So I'm just going to run the method, run the main method. Eventually, it will call the new core three constructor right here. And that's when we'll hit the breakpoint. So I'm going to show you what happens when that happens. So we're running it in debug mode. This just popped up. Let's see. Let's see what we can glean from this. So we're in, notice right there, that's the stack frame we're in. It says core3.init. If you see that, you're in a constructor. Now, which object, which object is being initialized? Can you tell from this line right here? So it says this right there. This is the method being construct is the object being constructed. Okay? You see this in the debugger? This is the object being constructed. So which object is being constructed right now? In fact, an object has been created and now you're filling in the fields, filling in the instance variable. <coughs> hmm. Well, let's go back to the main stack frame and let's see what variables are up there. P3 and P4 are, no, we haven't gotten far enough yet. It hasn't been constructed, so never mind that. What information is on that line? What type of thing is the object that's being constructed? What type of thing is this? Yeah? A core 3. A core 3, because it says that up there. Which core 3 object is it? With two parameter? No, that... An easy answer, it's right there, yeah? No, I don't see a P5 up there. Yeah? Yes, yeah, it's, it's object number 17, that's what it says. It says ID equals 17. So object number 17 was just passed in. Was, is, object 17 is the one that this constructor is trying to initialize. If we look inside of ob object 17, what are we gonna find? A lat and a long. They don't have a value yet. And these are the two parameters of the constructor, lat core and long core. So let's step through the core, let's, let's step through the constructor code and watch what changes up there. Make room for all this. So we check to see if the latitude is in range, the longitude is in range. Now just watch. It says lat equals lat core. Which lat? Whose lat is going to change when we do this? Number 17. Object 17's lat and long are going to change. Why? Why object 17 instead of object 19 or object 2? Yeah? Because um, it's, it's part of the, because it's an instance variable and it's only tied to this particular object. Well, okay, so to summarize what he said, it's the object that's being constructed. Object 17 was just created with the new, and now it's being initialized with the constructor. And so when I do lat gets lat coord, Step over it, you'll notice that up there at the top, the lat will change to 17, right? To 5. Okay, so lat just changed and then long. So it's the lat and long of a particular object just got changed. Yeah? Um, this, from a little bit back with the console, why is it printing 4 is dot 4 is 1 and then the memory location? 
Why is it printing it down here? Yeah. That's just the default way an object is printed out. Type name, at sign, memory location. So, we just That's right. If you don't tell it a better way to convert an object to a string, that's just how it does it. Okay. okay. So let's, we're, we're through with this constructor, and let's, so let's step out. So I'm going to step out, back up here to main. And let's see what we've got at this point. We've got a P, we should have a P5 here. And look, it's object 17. So what should we see if we open up object 17? Definitely that's the one that just got constructed. We see the 5 and the 8. This is the object the constructor was working on. So look at what happened here. We created a new core, 3. That created object 17. Then we called the constructor. That filled in the instance variables. And then we stored that object, a reference to that object in P5. So P5 contains a reference to object 17. Object 17 is one of these guys that got stamped out. And the lat was set to... Uh, Five, and the line sheet was set to eight. <coughs> What's going to happen now when we execute that statement right there? What will happen? Yeah? Uh, it's added a new object in the memory with two parameters, len and uh, link, and uh, assign seven and nine to them. Okay, so first thing he said was it'll create a new core three object, right here? It says right here, create a new core three object. So what that means is it'll create a new core three object in memory somewhere with room to store a lat and a lot. Then what will it do? What's the next step after, the, after that memory has been created? Yeah? Okay. It will call the constructor, and the constructor will store the Latin along. Now, will it change Latin along up here? No. That's a different object. It will change Latin along of the new object just got created. So let's step in. Here we are in. Uh, uh, here and what object is being modified now? What object is being constructed? Up here, look at this. This is the object the constructor is working on. Which one is being worked on? Number 48. And we're about to set its latitude to 7, its longitude to 6, to, to 9. So I step, I step, I set object 48's lat, and I set, I have to open it up here, so I just changed to 7. And then I set the other, I set the longitude to 9. So when you look at this code, if that's all you know, you can't say whose object is being, which object is being modified. It depends on which object is being constructed. Now, when we step out, we're back in the main. We see there is P5 and, and there is P6. P5 has 5 and 8 stored in its Latin long. P6 has 7 and 9 stored in its Latin long. The only difference was what met, what was passed to the constructors. Okay? Yeah? Well, can I say P5 and P6 is the name of the object? And no, the P5 and P6 are not the name of the object. What's the right way to think about P5 and P6? They're not names of, of the object. They're names of variables. But what, do the, what does P5 contain? Yeah? What'd you say? It's a reference to which object? What does P5 contain? It contains a reference to object 17. P6 contains a reference to object 48. What if I could do this? What if I said P5 gets P6? Let's see if I can make a change to running program here. So I'm going to step over that print. didn't work too well. Let me run it again. You get different ideas. Okay, 
so I, I do that, I do that. Okay, I'm about to get to where I want to be. All right, so P5 and P6. You know, P5 contains object 17, P6 contains object 35 this time. Then I'm going to print out, I'm going to execute that display statement. That'll print some stuff out. I'm not interested in that right now. What's going to happen when I run, when I say P5 gets P6? What's going to change about my stuff up there? What does P5 gets P6 do? Yeah? Uh, the P6 address is going to be assigned to P5. Right. He said P6's address gets assigned to P5. Right now it says P5 contains object 17. And it says P6 contains object 35. Well, I'm about to store object 35's reference into P5. So when I execute that, now P5 and P6, P6 just both refer to the same object. They both contain a reference to the same object. And of course, if we crack it open, we'll see that P5 that long, P6 that long. P5 and P6 refer to the same object. So of course, their instance variables have the same values. Yeah? Does P5's old address still exist? Uh, does P, well, he said, does P, well, I, the proper way to ask that is, does, does the old object, what was it, 17? Does object 17 still exist? Okay. Well, that thing is, no, there are no, it's not referred to from anywhere. It's not doing any good. It's just taking up space. And in fact, what Java does, Java has something called a garbage collector. Periodically, usually when memory starts to run low, the garbage collector runs, goes finds objects that aren't needed anymore, and gets rid of them. So there's space for other things. So yeah, it exists for a while, but it's useless. Eventually it goes away. Okay, now, let's see if we can finish this tour here. That was chord three. Let's look at what's different in chord four. Okay, in chord four, all I did was make lat and long private. That won't change anything about what I've demonstrated. What will it make impossible? Yeah? Right, there's no way now for outside the class to change lat and long of any object. Yeah? Um, for the previous, uh, previous example, when you're saying how when you do P5 equals P6, mm -hmm. they now both reference the same object. Mm -hmm. So if I change P5, would P6 also change? Since okay, well, let's think about this. P5 and P6 P5 and P6 now refer to the same object. And he said, what happens if I change P5? Well, what do you mean by changing P5? Well, say you do um, p5.lat uh, is equal to mine. Okay, so suppose you do p5.lat gets 10. All right, it's going to go p5, it's going to go over the object, it's going to change it to a 10. Okay, did that change, what did that change about p6? p6 still refers to the same object it did before. And, and you'll see the difference. P, p6.lat is now 10 as well, because they refer to the same object. All right, this example here, got two minutes. I just made them private like they're supposed to be. It didn't change anything else. That just prevents programmers from going around the back door and directly modifying the instance variables. We want them to have to go through the constructor because we can do checking in the constructor. There are other reasons. Yeah? Would you ever do something like P5 equals P6 because in the end they're both the same object? He said, would, would you ever do something like assigning P5 to P6? Yes, it happens. But when you change one, you change the other. Yeah, sometimes it's just, uh, have you ever written in a program X gets Y or something? You, you store what's in Y into X for some reason. Yeah, we'll see examples where it's useful. But I at least want to introduce chord five before we run out of time here. Okay, chord five, it has the private lat and the private long. It has the same constructor as before, except it's called chord five. But now, I have added two methods. And what's different from these methods and the ones that you've written in the past? Yeah? They're not static. They're not static. So these become methods that you can invoke on an object. Get latitude and get longitude and to string are now methods that you can invoke on an object. So the last thing I'll show you here, we'll have to finish this next time. Here is, so down here we're printing out point 0.1, point 0.2. I can say point 0.1, 
dot, get latitude. So when you define a non-static method, you have provided, you're defining objects that can be invoked, you're defining methods that can be invoked on an object. So when you define a class, you decide on the instance variables, you create constructors to create the objects, you provide methods to manipulate the objects. So we'll pick up with this next time. Joe. Joe.